The next morning, I got up and grabbed my Army New Testament. Now, in the service, we couldn't understand the Bible. So we just discarded the Bible. But now I found my New Testament, which was sent home in my foot locker when I was declared dead, sat under a tree and began to read. You're talking about a miracle. The first time in my life I understood what the Bible was saying. Not all of it, but I understood the plan of salvation, Christ on the cross, and tears began to roll down my face. Conversion is a miracle. Understand the scriptures are a miracle because that's proof that the Spirit of God did come into your heart. Hello, Bezel Triple Three. That was Louis Zamperini telling of his conversion to Christianity and how after he began trusting in the Lord Jesus for his salvation, the Bible became alive to him. He says that conversion is a miracle and that understanding the scriptures is a miracle. And he's right. Did you catch the end of the intro? It says... See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. Now, even though she's saying, choose love, choose light, I thought it was close enough to what the passage in Deuteronomy 30 is actually saying. And this is a very interesting situation. On the one hand, we have God saying, through Moses, choose life. And on the other hand, we have Louis saying that salvation and understanding the gospel is a miracle. So, which is it? Well, before we get to that answer, I thought a few of you might be interested in my history with Louis Zamperini. I grew up a toddler at Hollywood Presbyterian Church where Louis also attended and was at the time a youth leader along with a youth minister by the name of Jim Ferguson, who was himself quite a legend in his own right, although he would never have thought so. He was taken home to be with the Lord at an early age by having a heart attack while riding a bicycle. And although I was much too young to have gotten to know Jim very well, I do, however, remember the nursery that I grew up in. From the age of 10 or so, I have memories of Louie. Back in the day, Baskin Robbins 31 Flavors Ice Cream Company had a slate gray licorice ice cream. And somehow Louie, who liked licorice, was able to attain by his many contacts the gooey pitch black concentrate used to make the ice cream. I remember Louie taking me and my buddies over to his house once in a while and he would make us licorice milkshakes. Absolute liquid gold if you happen to like licorice. As I became of high school age, we would go on church high school department skiing trips and Louie, busy as he was, would always make time to go with us. Well, actually he was a skiing nut. And also he was good friends with the owner of Mammoth Mountain in California and would secure free lift tickets to high school kids for the church. I remember being on a chairlift with him and listening while Louis would tell me that he shares the gospel of Jesus with every person that rides a chairlift with him because for five minutes or so they can't go anywhere and they had to listen to him. In the early 1980s, Louis ran a senior lunch program the church while I worked there as a custodian. Here he is with then Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley getting some kind of award. He would constantly be yucking it up with seniors and make them laugh and feel like family when they were there. Here is Louie on a skateboard right outside the large room where he ran the lunch program. Louie was always finding ways to help out when there was a need. Here he is working on the church bus with others from the church. While working with Louie at the church, I would chat with him for a few minutes almost every day, and occasionally I would go up to his office 
and he would show me, well, he had a cadre of reel-to-reel -reel films, uh, many of World War II, and we'd watch them together, and he'd tell me stories. He'd show me other interesting films as well. Here is a copy of one of his life story comic books that he signed for my son. Louis said something to me once that I'll never forget. He said, you must be able to adapt to whatever happens. And if you know Louis's story, then you know that he is the embodiment of that statement. That is the Louis Zamperini that I knew, always available to listen, always wanting to tell a joke or a story. Louis was not a bigger-than-life hero to me, as much as he was a truly authentic human being, a redeemed sinner who always wanted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with anyone who would listen. But what I want to talk about is not adaptation, but human free will and regeneration. Remember what Louis said at the beginning of this video. He said that conversion is a miracle and understanding the scriptures is a miracle. And yet, we're told to choose life. So my question is this, is salvation all of God's doing or is it a cooperative effort between God and the willing sinner? There are passages that seem to indicate that the sinner has the ability to turn towards God. Perhaps the most well-known passage is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Which seems to say that anyone, anyone who wants to can be saved. I mean, is not whosoever all-inclusive? Does it not mean any single one of us? Well, yes, it does. But notice what it says there. It says, whosoever believes. And the question is, how does a person come to the point of truly believing the gospel? And it is here, my friends, that we must not simply scratch the surface, but we must do some digging to get to the truth of the matter. Now, let's look at what the Bible says about moral free will, and let's start from the beginning. The first couple, Adam and Eve, having been made innocent and in God's image, had the freedom and ability to do what was good and pleasing before God. Ecclesiastes 7, 29. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. You see, Adam and Eve had a will that was innocent, but it was also mutable, which means subject to change. This is seen in God's warning to them not to disobey Him by doing the one thing that He commanded them not to do, eating of the fruit. This, it was this mutability and the tempting of Satan that led to the fall of humanity into a state of sin. Romans 8, 6, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And, and the word flesh there means uh, the unsaved or unregenerate heart, or the unregenerate man. Now, what this means is that man still has the freedom to choose, you can still choose, but you no longer have the ability to choose what is morally good and pleasing to God. In other words, man can only choose that which is in accordance with his present nature, which is now a sinful nature. Romans 3.12 helps us here. It's a quote from the Old Testament. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what must happen if sinners who are dead in sin are to be made alive to the things of God? Well, what is needed is a valley of dry bones moment for each and every one of us. I refer you to Ezekiel 36 on in to chapter 37. Monergism, single work, God and God alone can produce life where there was no life. When God, by His unmerited favor alone, frees a sinner from his bondage to sin, He gives him a new nature, him or her, I'm sorry, a new nature that is enabled once again through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, like Adam before the fall, to do that which is spiritually good. Yet, the Christian does these things imperfectly and is still capable of much evil due to the residue of that old sinful nature with its remaining corruption that continues to reside within the Christian until death. What I'm talking about here is nothing short 
of spiritual regeneration. Uh, not that kind of regeneration. <laughs> that was a lesser known Beatles ditty called Spiritual Regeneration, uh, quickly coughed up by the Fab Four while they were experiencing a spiritual high during a trip to India. Now, what I'm talking about and what happened to Louis and every other true Christian when God the Holy Spirit inwardly calls a sinner out of that natural state of sin and its wretched consequences into the state of grace and salvation within and because of the Lord Jesus Christ, as 2 Timothy 1 tells us. And there we read, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. The Holy Spirit does this through the Word of God, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel, that you might gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, my friends, is the miracle that Louis was referring to. It is the moment that the gospel makes sense to us and we know we need it more than anything else in the world. Christianity is historical in that the person and work of Jesus is well documented. Now, here's faith, okay? One can read the gospels and say, well, I've, I've read the stories of the life of Jesus. Well, that, that's knowledge, okay? And one can even say, I believe that the Gospels are truthful accounts of what happened to Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that's agreement. So you've got knowledge and agreement. But it's not until a person comes to the realization that what Jesus did for sinners by becoming their substitute and living the life they should be living and dying the death that we deserve to die, that what he did, he did for me, a sinner in need of salvation. This is when true saving faith begins. That kind of faith, that uh, contained knowledge, assent, and trust only comes through the regenerating work of the Spirit of God. See, faith is no small deal. The fact is that it is impossible without being gifted to you by God. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. See, this is a fallen world we live in. We all have darkened minds until God the Holy Spirit opens our closed eyes and ears. That is why there are so many competing schemes of salvation that try and short-circuit the need to trust in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, take Hinduism, for example. What is the significance of the Ganges River? And as a Christian, how do you interpret the significance of, of this river in the light of Christ and his resurrection? So the significance of River Ganges is amazing in the Hindu faith because it's considered that if you come once in your lifetime to this River Ganges and take a holy cleansing dip, your past, present and future sins are all absorbed. Okay, So it is a shortcut for salvation. You know, When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is discipleship, there is maturity, there is obedience, there is growth, there is prayer, there is service. You know, all that is taken care in one shot by coming here to the River Ganges. And you know, it is very easy to say this, that all these people around us who are taking a, a holy cleansing dip into this uh, supposed uh, river uh, where it washes your sins away, 
it is very easy to be dismissive about them. But what I would like to say to you is that these are the people who are here absolutely misled by the same deceiver into believing uh, that this is true. Bringing them to a wrong stream because there is still that stream flowing from the, from the cross which sinners plunge into it, wash their sins away. So that is the message that has to be proclaimed to these people. So th this is an alternative uh, that, uh, that uh, the adversary has planted in the world, that there are these alternative rivers, these other ways of yes. having your sins forgiven. Yeah. You see, friends, there, there is no other stream. Jesus is the only way of being reconciled to an infinite, holy God who is justly offended by our sins. Louis Zamperini discovered this truth by hearing the gospel in conjunction with the inward call of the Holy Spirit. Louis' soul is right now in the presence of the Lord Jesus as his body rests in the grave awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ in glory. As it says in Deuteronomy 30, there is a land where Christians are to enter. It is what the Bible calls the new heavens and the new earth. Friends, if you're not a Christian, consider the gospel. Read the gospel accounts and take a good look at your life. Are you really competent to stand before a righteous and holy God on your own merit? Or are you willing to admit and confess that you, like me, are a sinner in need of a Savior? God will forgive your sins and He'll heal your heart. But there's only one way to God, and that's through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, because He's the only one in history to take our you know, sins. When, when Jesus Christ got a... Uh, came to this earth and we we're celebrating Christmas. He came uh, to save sinners. Uh, Franklin Graham is a sinner. Louis Zamprini is a sinner. But God sent his son from heaven to this earth and he went to the cross and he shed his blood for our sins and he was buried for our sins. But God raised him to life. And he'll come into any heart that's willing to trust him, to invite him into their life. And Louis Zamprini was, was at the end of his road and when he experienced God's forgiveness and his life was changed.